Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to some of you on, on the West Coast. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Ramit Mishori. I'm Senior Medical Advisor at Physicians for Human Rights, and I have the pleasure of filling in for PHR's Executive Director, Donna McKay, and introducing today's topic and moderator. Today's conversation is the 28th in PHR's COVID-themed webinar series, which since launching in March has been examining implications of the pandemic through the lens of health and human rights. We are 10 days away from um, election day, and in case you haven't noticed, tensions have been running high, at least reports of tensions, but it feels like the clock has been ticking all year long. Back in June, we heard a ticking when one of today's panelists, Dr. Rohini Har, moderated a panel on the Black community and how it was hit hardest by the pandemic. And it is also the same community most affected by racial injustice and the medical ramifications of this reality. Then in, in August, we heard it again when we facilitated a conversation about policing practices in public health. Recently, we heard the talk the clock ticking yet again as we released a report by a team of PHR researchers, including our own executive director, Donna McKay, our medical director, Michelle Heisler, and our senior program officer, Catherine Hampton, who documented excessive and disproportionate use of force against protesters and medics in Portland, Oregon. They documented significant injuries inflicted by local police and federal officers and on protesters, on medics, on journalists, and legal observers that constitute concerning human rights violations. This research was a continuation of PHR's long history of documenting the health effects of so-called non-lethal weapons when deployed with excessive and often deadly force in protest and other civilian settings. Now with 10 days to go, we have almost 400 people signed up today. Um, so thank you for your interest. We're going to talk through the tensions, the dangers, the excessive use of force, the threats to the public's health and to individual health that could flare up around the response to potential election results and election related violence. PHR has a set of reports and tools that we have developed and curated and we will be sharing those uh, throughout the webinar today with you in the chat. So let's get started. Um, we are once again fortunate to have with us to moderate today's conversation, Dr. Jennifer Leaning. Dr. Leaning is a professor of the practice of health and human rights at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and an associate professor of emergency medicine at the Harvard Medical School. She's also the former director and now senior, a senior fellow at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. Dr. Leaning is also a member of our advisory council where she, along with other leading experts in medicine, the law and science provide guidance to PHR um, for our activities and projects and research. Dr. Leaning's research focuses on human rights, on international humanitarian, humanitarian law and public health and policy responses to humanitarian crises. Jennifer, thank you for being with us today. I'm now going to switch roles from greeter to panelist, and I turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Renit. And it is a, a pleasure and honor to be moderating this very consequential panel. Um, it, um, as um, Renit mentioned, we're here today as over 50 million people, as of today's count, I gather, um, have already cast ballots uh, for the upcoming November 3rd election. Uh, it is one of the most consequential US elections in our time, perhaps in the history of the United States. And as we prepare for this, and all of you please vote if you haven't already, um, the um, turnout is going to be high, we know, on the day of the election. And uh, there are a number of possible scenarios that um, might occur um, as the votes are being counted and once hopefully they have been allowed to be fully counted. And uh, then when the winner is announced, some of those scenarios kick in perhaps into higher gear. And uh, we, we're, we're a divided country now. And uh, as we um, think about what is possible, we have to recognize that in the last few months, the killing of George Floyd at the hands of uh, police officer Derek Chauvin in uh, Minneapolis 
um, led to many protests on along the lines of Black Lives Matter. And uh, we faced the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has also elicited an extreme stress, but a lot of uh, controversy around the ways in which we keep each other safe. And so these protests and demonstrations across the country have different roots, but what they um, allow us to understand is that this is a restive and um, uh, disturbed population at the moment because of many of the things that we have seen in the last year. Uh, the roots are, of course, go far deeper, but we're heading into a very pivotal moment in our political and social history. Um, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI have both described this election as a potential flashpoint for reactionary violence. Um, and PHR has been very involved in monitoring demonstrations over the last year, and the reports are out that are excellent, and we'll refer to them as we get in deeper into the program. Uh, but they, um, uh, what we understand from all of the studies that have been done on these demonstrations is that the vast majority of them in support of racial justice have been peaceful and, uh, and new research points this out. There is a, a recent Washington Post article by um, Erica Shenowitz of the Harvard Kennedy School, where it looks as if from May to June of this year, um, she found that she looked at 70, no, sorry, 7,000 anti-racist demonstrations and found that 96% of these involved no property or police damage or police injuries. And almost in almost 98%, no injuries were reported. That's pretty an astonishing set of peaceful indicators. Um, how in front of this election, however, there is a risk of heightened po political polarization, a national reckoning on racial justice and police brutality. And uh, there's new energy in um, militia-like groups that have been established and become increasingly more outspoken. Um, and it's a possibility that a contested election could lead to election-related violence. It's a possibility. And we have to be thinking in those terms quite concretely and quite practically. So what we're gonna do today with our two experts on the panel is to delve more deeply into how we can prepare as uh, communities um, and as people who may be involved in providing support to um, the peaceful demonstrations. Um, we need to be prepared for potential violence. And the speakers here have a great deal of experience in um, seeing, witnessing and um, helping in contexts where there has been um, significant violence and uh, what they're gonna do is share their insights and uh, speak to the PHR resource. And, uh, and I think, I think the, the resources that PHR has amassed um, are going to be online and many of them are online now for you to look at, but uh, this will be an encapsulated version of the um, insights from um, the minds and hearts of people who have contributed to this research and these reports. So it's a particularly um, intense moment for us. And uh, I hope you'll find it a very educational and if not sobering experience. So with that, I'm very happy to introduce today's panelists. Um, our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Rohini Har. She's a PHR medical advisor, uh, adjunct professor at the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health and an emergency medicine physician. She's an expert on crowd control weapons and co-author of PHR's 2016 report called Lethal in Disguise, which examines the misuse and the abuse of crowd control weapons. The detrimental health effect of these weapons um, when they are misused or applied to large numbers of people and their impact on the meaningful enjoyment of freedom of assembly and protection. She's also a member of PHR's asylum network and assists in um, asylum evaluations. Um, she's also very interested in humanitarian work um, more generally, and I first met her in Geneva at a meeting about a year ago, so it's excellent to see you here again. Um, and uh, I think, Rohini, before you move, I'm going to introduce Renit also, so then you can just move in smoothly, Renit, after Rohini has finished her remarks, if that's okay. And so to reintroduce um, Dr. Mashori, she is, uh, uh, in addition to her role as senior uh, medical advisor to PHR, she is a professor of family medicine at the Georgetown University School of Medicine and interim chief public health officer at Georgetown University. 
She's been a member of PHR's Asylum Network since 2006 and has served as an expert consultant to PHR's program on sexual violence in conflict zones since 2011. She served as a faculty advisor to Georgetown's asylum program since it began in 2014. So please um, sit back, stay alert, and, uh, and enjoy the uh, contributions from these two very, very skilled and knowledgeable panelists. Thank you. So Dr. Herrick, please. Thank you, Jennifer. And it's such a pleasure and an honor to be on a panel with both of you. Um, let me just share my screen as I speak here. But today I'd like to speak about uh, excuse me, crowd control weapons in the United States. And at PHR, we've been studying these weapons and the context of the right to free expression and the right to free speech for 20, uh, 30, even more years. Uh, and so today I'd like to speak a little bit about the concerns in the United States though much of our research has been global. I think this is critical and relevant right now because there are so many actors involved. And uh, as we've seen over the summer, protests are uh, not uncommon in the United States. It's important for demonstrators to understand the kind of weapons that could be used. It's particularly important for health workers to understand what might be coming to them both in the emergency department, but also over time and long term, uh, for citizens and for the entire public to really understand the scope of the weapons that are freely permitted to be used in the United States against uh, protesters. I will say that there's multiple actors involved in protests and demonstrations. There's of course the demonstrators themselves. These days we also see a lot of counter protesters, um, uh, People often talk about, you know, agent provocateurs who are sort of planted in protests and can be violent. And today I'll focus specifically on crowd control weapons because that's what law enforcement primarily has, um, has at its, in its arsenal. And what uh, is deeply concerning is the human rights implications around that. So, um, there's a few different classifications of weapons and I'll just quickly go through those and the kind of injuries that you might see from these as kind of a way to highlight uh, what's important to think about if you are a demonstrator, if you're a protester or um, a health worker or even just part of the public. So the top two images here are what we call traditional rubber bullets. So uh, multiple projectiles that come in a single canister, whether they're little um, balls or cylindrical, uh, when multiple shots are fired at once, those are traditionally called traditional rubber bullets. Sometimes they're made of rubber, but frequently they're made of multiple other things, little pieces of plastic or PVC or, or very hard foam. And then next to the uh, words, you can see what we call beanbag rounds or sometimes called flexible baton rounds, which are teeny synth uh, synthetic bags with small metal pellets in them. And at the bottom there, you can see a foam or sponge round or a pepper ball, which are some of the newer weapons. The pepper ball has pepper spray inside something like a paintball. And then the sponge round you can see has multiple components, very, very hard foam on top, much harder than you know, a Nerf, which sounds like sponge, and then plastic and sometimes metal components as well. There's over 75 different kinds of projectiles and innumerable different kinds of guns or weapons that fire them. And so it's really hard to pin down, but most police departments have multiple different kinds of weapons that they can use. The range of injuries caused by these kinetic impact projectiles is over the entire body, but the vast majority of deeply concerning or severe injuries are often to the eyes, the skin, and the bones and muscles and lungs. So, uh, Please forgive me, I'm gonna show a few images that may be disturbing to some folks, but I think it's really important to understand very concretely and visually the kind of injuries that these weapons cause. So from rubber pellets, especially when there's multiple rounds, you can see frequently skin abrasions or cuts and you can see multiple ones are fired on this young man. They can also cause pretty deep skin lacerations. You can see this one is just above the eye. Um, what 
we don't see when we often worry about bruises and skin injury is internal bleeding because beyond the penetrative injuries and the lacerations, they can cause often internal bleeding and blunt trauma. And what's most concerning to me is the frequency of head, neck, and eye injuries. So this is just a quick view of some uh, cranial injuries. I didn't want to show you the, the gory <laughs> uh, pictures of people, but I'll show you some CT scans. So this is a rubber pellet that lodged inside uh, a skull fracture, another skull fracture here. Um, this is deeply concerning the eye injuries that are caused by these weapons. And also you can see when there's pellets or small amounts that they can lodge in multiple different places over the body. Uh, here's a deeper view of that. So that rubber bullet there just lodged right inside the globe. You can imagine that the eye is probably one of the most sensitive parts of your body. There's really no protection there from a large blunt object. And most people who get hit in the eye from a rubber bullet uh, experience permanent blindness. Uh, and you can see another couple injuries there. When we did a systematic review of the literature back in 2016 and published it, we identified, I think, something like 90 people who had permanent eye and head injuries. That was just in the medical literature. This summer, we did another study called Shot in the Head, where we just looked at um, social media reports of these injuries. And in three months alone, we found 115 severe head, neck, and eye injuries. Most of the people with eye injuries had permanent vision loss. And just to let that sink in, my point is that so little is known about these weapons because there's very little surveillance or monitoring of how law enforcement is permitted to use these weapons. There's so little regulation around them that really it's kind of the wild west of weapons. Uh, particularly dangerous, if we had to think about it, are things like I mentioned earlier, the traditional rubber bullets that are scattershot and anything with metal content. And what's even more dangerous is misuse, things like disproportionate use when they're used far more than they ever needed to be because of the violence in a protest, and specifically firing at the head or the eyes. In the past, five years ago, 10 years ago, I used to say, you know, from a distance, it's impossible to aim these, so they become indiscriminate. And at close range, they can be extremely dangerous. My experience in the past few months has heightened this experience even more. At close ranges and even medium ranges, these bullets are able to be targeted even more and more. And the deep concern there is that the number of head and significant eye injuries that we're seeing um, means that, you know, either they're firing from awfully close, they're firing from so far that they shouldn't be firing weapons or that they're targeting the eyes. Uh, briefly, I'll go through a few other weapons. So chemical irritants, these are all different types of tear gas and pepper spray. So you can see canisters, you can see um, uh, pepper spray or OC grass coming out of the canister itself. Sometimes these are fired out of grenades and more and more we're seeing globally that people are mixing these chemical irritants inside water cannons or putting them in those pepper balls I mentioned and really mixing the weapons up, which confuses the picture far more. The injuries here that we see are primarily to the eyes and the skin, but the severe injuries, the ones that cause permanent disability and death are often to the respiratory system. It's a particularly high risk when people have asthma or underlying medical conditions, or say when there's a global pandemic that focuses on the respiratory system. So skin irritation is most frequent and most common. And you'll remember that tear gas is completely indiscriminate. When a canister is fired, it's not targeting a single person. It's targeting every single person in that crowd, whether that's a small child or an elderly person, all of whom have the right to free expression, all of them will experience this. The big worries that we worry about, uh, the things we worry about include the canister itself can cause significant injuries. There's also uh, chemical burns and allergic reactions. This is in a military recruit um, and severe chemi chemical burns. We also see chemical skin rashes, especially to those protesters who have experienced it more than once. You can develop an allergy to it. 
And again, you can see that burn coming down his chest where the uh, pepper spray dripped. And these are even second degree burns, especially when the canister is near the leg or a lot is fired. Eye injuries include corneal abrasions um, and chemical burns of the eye. And again, as I mentioned, the chemical lung injuries are the most concerning. So you can see here, uh, the right is the normal in a 16 year old girl that experienced this many years ago, and the left is her bronch. Uh, I would argue that tear gas is pretty indiscriminate and frequently misused and something to be really wary of if you are a health worker or a demonstrator to be aware of the kind of risks that these weapons pose. Other frequently uh, used weapons, I'll just walk through very briefly just so you know. Stun grenades are also called flashbangs, so they emit a very, very uh, bright flash and a very lar large uh, sound at the same time, which tends to cause chaos in a protest, as you can imagine. People can run all over the place, but also blindness. A big worry here is that they can cause significant burns and lacerations if you are next to or close to where that stun grenade fires. Water cannons are another significant injury uh, issue, so not used as much in the past in the United States because of our uh, long and ugly history with using them in the civil rights movement, but certainly can cause a lot of secondary injuries, sometimes blindness. And often uh, you can see that picture in Uganda. I've seen this in Hong Kong and India and elsewhere as well um, in the past few months and a uh, year is putting colored dye, which can basically brand people, and so they could be arrested later. And you can see that secondary fall injury is going to be a significant concern here. Sound cannons are used more and more frequently all over the United States. I actually saw one on the Berkeley campus last year, um, which was really disturbing. Uh, these can be incredibly dangerous and have caused several incidents of deafness when people are awfully close to them, which they can be. Tasers or other electrical conduction devices are being used more and more in protest settings. Uh, the most concerning here is that those uh, spikes from the taser can uh, be misaimed or hurt people. And then of course, if you have uh, riot shields that are electrified, then those can be pretty damaging as well. A couple people have asked me in the few months this has been in the news about these directed energy weapons or the lasers. There is very little known about these right now, and I hope that it continues that way. But uh, essentially, it would be a like a heat ray <laughs> that makes your skin feel like it's burning uh, and fired up to a kilometer or two away. It's been tested in the military, uh, primarily in Iraq, I believe. And I hope that we never see this in the United States. Um, I'll just end and say that all of these weapons are, uh, you know, except the heat rays are pretty available to the law enforcement in the United States. But when they use them, if they use them, it should be under basic guidelines that it's necessary and that it's proportionate. And some of these weapons really shouldn't be used at all. I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of this afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Rohini, thank you very much. There is actually a question from um, someone in the audience who is um, asking your advice about what sorts of masks are suitable or best used for protection against the chemical agents. So, you know, I've seen, so police often use gas masks or respirators. Um, if you're trying to protect yourself against the weapons, that might be best. But more deeper than that, like, all of us have a right to free speech and expression without having to go out and buy masks. It's not really on us to um, to purchase those items, and you know, even those who can't afford that or can't find them have a right to free speech. It's really up to law enforcement to support those those rights, um, rather than uh, rather than us to defend ourselves. I'll let Renit finish that one as well. I think no, well, I think that's a, I think it's a very good um, framing, and I know Renit will get into it in more detail in her remarks. But um, your point that this is free speech, so why do we have to protect against the toxicity of um, misuse of tear gas? Um, is a very good, very good response. Uh, so thank you for this. Did you have something else to add, um, or shall I turn it over now to um, Renit? Yeah, let's turn it over. Okay, good. So thank you. The floor is yours, Dr. Mishori, please. 
Thank you. I mean, of course, um, free speech, um, but we have to be prepared. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, preparedness um, on, on that level. Um, but just generally kind of to put it in a in context for me, um, in, in um, November 2000, I, was, uh, I just became a, a US citizen and I voted for the first time in an American presidential election. It was very exciting. Um, and as we were watching the returns um, that evening, I remember telling my son who was about four at that time that you know he was falling asleep as we were watching TV. And I said, you know, when we wake up in the morning, um, there will be a new president. And, and that of course did not really happen. And for those of you um, who were perhaps too young, that was the year of, the, of Gore v. Bush and uh, the infamous um, Florida recount. Um, so what followed then in 2000 was a sort of as unexpected as it was confusing and legally chaotic and, and it went on for weeks. And now kind of fast forward 20 years and now we're anticipating perhaps another contested election and uh, experts are foreseeing confusion and legal case again, chaos. Um, but really, I, as, as Jennifer mentioned before, what's different this time is that we're also expecting chaos of another kind, namely intimidation, potentially protest, unrest, per perhaps becoming um, violent. And, and all of this is taking place in the middle of a pandemic, which carries its own additional risks. So yeah, people can't just go out to exercise their, their right to protest to peaceful assembly um, like they did two years ago or, or 20 years ago. Um, and even though that is, as, as Rohini was saying, we need to think about that as a, as a right, um, we also need to be um, aware of the dangers and, and prepare and take precautions to, for everyone who decides to do that um, to protect themselves. So I like to think about um, what it means to protect yourself in, in three ways. First of all, um, as the, the, the um, information that Rohini gave, obviously educate yourself about what's going on. And in, in the context of, of COVID, Educate yourself. So I, I like to think about as, as pre-protest, during a protest, and then following a protest. So pre-protest, educate yourself about the potential harm, just like uh, Rohini was just explaining to us the potential injuries from the various uh, crowd control weapons. Think about what you need to bring to mitigate the effort. If you decide to go out, think about what do I need to bring? Is it, there was a question about, about a mask. Do I need to bring a particular mask? Do I need to bring eye protection? Do I need to bring extra masks in, in, in case something falls off? And then when you're thinking about it, think about it both in the context of COVID and in the context of the use of uh, crown control weapons. Um, do I need to bring water? Do I need to bring extra cash? Do I need to bring uh, goggles? Do I need to bring my own glasses? Do I need to not wear glasses? Um, do I need to wear certain clothes? Should I wear shorts? Should I wear sandals? All of these things um, is something that you I recommend to people to prepare ahead of time uh, and think about ahead of time and then try to run scenarios in your mind. What happens when you are there? If somebody does open fire, God forbid, or if, if there are cannons or if there's tear gas, what are you going to do? Have a plan in your uh, in your mind, see if you if there is a if there are medics. Are you can you anticipate whether medics are going to be around? Um, what does COVID mean about how you're going to protest? Um, I recommend usually to um, wear a mask and use groggers or other noisemakers and and signs as opposed to screaming and yelling and singing, which we know is. Um, is a mode of transmission that's more that's riskier. Think about marching and not staying in one place. Think about as social distancing as much as possibly uh, as you possibly can during a demonstration. Again, so pr preparation is is really important. Uh, and then what happens if you encounter such um, crown control weapon use? Um, what do you do afterwards? Where do you go? Um, do you have another set of uh, clothing to change? Um, how do you get home? Um, so all of these things, despite the fact that it's ab absolutely clear that this is a right that all Americans have, we still need to be prepared. And I'm looking, I look forward to giving a little bit more guidance uh, about all of that, along with my colleague, Dr. Har. And also we have prepared at Physicians for Human Rights some, um, some uh, tools that I think are being um, added to the chat as we speak. So I look forward to um, getting questions if you have them. Uh, so 
thank you very much for this um, very important set of insights that you've both shared with us. And um, I would um, now like to uh, open this up to the Q&A from the audience and it will be moderated by the PHR um, staff who are here with us. Uh, but um, I'd like to ask you, um, Ranit, um, how you have decided, say with a buddy, which is usually wise, I think, to uh, participate in a peaceful demonstration um, against or for or something. And um, as you approach the place where you can tell from the noise and the crowd gathering that the demonstration is taking place, what are the signs you look for as you're approaching that make you wary about how it might unfold or almost immediately concerned about your safety? So I'm thinking about uh, things going down an alley where there's no exit. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? But I mean, as you're coming with your friend and you're approaching a slightly more open space, what goes through your mind as you're assessing safety? Yeah, and, and, and uh, Rohini, feel free to chime in, but I think what I do and what I recommend is watch the force in front of you, watch members of law enforcement, what are they doing or how are they moving towards you? There's a, there's a, a practice where they come from different uh, areas and kind of try to, what's called kettling, try to trap you. Are you in that situation where there's people moving from the side and other people moving from the front? Are they holding up their um, their their guns or their um, you know their uh, their weapons. Um, so think about that. Try not to be trapped. Of course, try not to be trapped in smaller areas where you can't run away. Especially if there's tear gas, then it's going to be harder to breathe. And of course, we we also need to remember that these situations cause a lot of panic. They cause chaos. And oftentimes, the, some of the injuries we see is, is people being trampled because they're they're fleeing, they're running away, um, which is why I always tell people to never go to a protest with uh, wearing flip-flops or sandals, always wear shoes that you can run in because there may be a situation where you have to run. Um, so that's um, kind of a general, general gist of what I would say, Rohini, I don't know if you wanna add to it. Uh, I, I would only add like the one small point of, I try to stay typically on the edges of a protest, like not quite right in the middle. It's easier to keep an eye on things and then it's easier to get away if, if things turn violent. I think there are a couple of obvious um, parameters that you haven't um, mentioned uh, because it, it, it's obvious, but I, could I just underscore them? You, yes. you should not go into these uh, demonstrations as a peaceful protester if you have any disability. I mean, if you have, you know, a sore ankle or you can't run or you have some problem with one arm or another, um, you, you need to be prepared, I would say, if you both agree, to be um, able to rescue yourself very quickly. I mean, I think that is one of the, that it's sober. Yeah. I mean, this is yeah. not- Yeah, so especially if, you know, if there's, you have heart disease, lung disease, and you anticipate that there may be use of tear gas. Uh, well, sometimes you can anticipate that, but, and also everybody has the right to, to demonstrate. Um, what I have also seen and told people is don't bring your pets. I see people bring their dogs to, to uh, demonstrations and then um, the, they freak out. You have to start running, the, do the dog is displaced and you're chasing the dog. Meanwhile, you're staying in the area where there's tear gas. So uh, don't bring babies, don't bring um, um, animals, um, service animals or other animals, I think that can be incredibly distracting. And I've seen that happen in, in DC where there was chaos because people lost their dogs. Um, so what about people who go to these demonstrations as human rights observers, which I think both of you would classify yourself, um, what are the things that you will be looking for and how do you document it without risk, causing risk to yourself? I think uh, right now the beauty is that everyone carries a phone with them wherever they go. It's actually wise from a safety perspective to be able to connect with people, but it's also a really good documentation tool. So um, I often do or recommend if you have it, have your phone on you. So if you see anything concerning happening um, to start documenting as many, many people often do. When you are documenting, there's some nice ways to make sure that you're doing it in a good way. That would include not just taking short clips, but longer clips that uh, identify the space that you're in, as well as landmarks and things like that, and uh, take place over time. 
once you have documented a video, make sure, well, I would usually say don't try to talk over it. Let the scene play out the way it is. You can always describe it in your tweet or whatnot afterwards, but um, try not to talk over it. And then once you have that video uh, from a human rights standpoint and from a documentation standpoint, I'd say be really careful of manipulating it or changing it in any way. It's best to keep it as raw as possible when you're sharing it with um, human rights organizations or the media or, or something else. Thank you. There are, there are some very good questions coming in um, now. So uh, get ready. Um, it, so, um, I think I'm going to direct this one first to you, uh, Rohini, uh, but then please feel free to chime in, Rennie. Um, so a question from the audience is, can you speak to the public health implications of heightened violence by police and extremist groups? Public health implications. I mean, I think the public health implications of violence have been well stated over and over again. In a protest, the implications, as the implication, there's broader implications in terms of the fact that many times when people are protesting or demonstrating, it's, it's against the government or some behavior or action of the government and promoting democracy or, you know, anti-corruption or um, climate change, justice, whatever. And so when protests are, uh, are broken up or people are intimidated away from going that to them or when there's a chilling effect, that ability to advocate for civil society to advocate for public health uh, changes is, is really threatened and undermined. And that's just kind of the broader one. The use of the weapons themselves, while, you know, if you think about the grand scheme of things, 115 people getting severe eye injuries in three months, some can say that's, I would say that that's incredibly significant. Some would say there's billion, millions of people protesting, that's not so much. But I'd say the number of people that are intimidated away from protesting, that stay home because they're afraid, and that has significant um, effects too. In the setting of coronavirus, this is even more troublesome in, from a pro public health perspective, um, because things like tear gas affect the respiratory system just like coronavirus. Here in California, we have this third climate change crisis with the air pollution and the incredibly bad air quality. And in all of those places, wearing masks is critical. But when you're being exposed to tear gas, the last thing you wanna do is keep on a mask that is soaked in a chemical irritant that makes you feel like you're gonna choke or suffocate. So the first thing people often do is take off their mask and cough which of course is the last thing you'd want them to do because of coronavirus. So I mean, the other thing, what, what I, <laughs> I would like to add to that, speech. how would you like to add? Yes, go ahead. I, what I could add to that is oftentimes when there's violence, there's police activity, there are arrests and the arrest actions themselves can impact public health of, of groups, especially right now during COVID when multiple people are shoved into police cars, when they're put in, um, in a jail cell overnight until they can post bail. Um, oftentimes we've heard stories actually when we documented um, the um, police brutality against medics in, in New York City is how medics themselves were, were put in, uh, um, in small spaces, uh, their masks were, were were off. They didn't they didn't have any new masks to uh, to provide, and they were all congregating together. So in and so the the violence can be part of, of of the arrest activities, but also we need to be super aware during COVID. Um, and um, I again I recommend to anyone who is going to go out to have multiple masks and you know one tucked in your shirt, one in your sh shoes, one in your um, you know, uh, pants pockets in case you lose one, and then you you find yourself in a in a cell with fifteen other people. Um, you can protect yourself. So I think again, preparation. It's all about preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. And as Rohini said, and as you said, most of the um, protests uh, recently have been very peaceful. And from the COVID perspective, also I haven't seen a single study that showed higher rates of um, 
COVID transmission post uh, these very, very, very large demonstrations in, in major cities. So while I'm not saying that you shouldn't worry about it, you absolutely should, and you should take measures to mitigate the spread of COVID. Uh, we haven't seen that as a, as a at this point, um, as a big public health effect of, uh, of mass demonstrations. So there's another question, um, Renit, that I would like to um, direct to you first, and then um, Rohini, please respond if you have further thoughts. Um, it's a uh, question about um, the role of medics in protests. They've been incredibly important here. This is what the um, person is saying. And I'm curious about the broader scene. What do you think about the role of medics? Their role, their importance, the risks? Um, you know, it, it's a very complicated question. And, and Rohini, please chime in. But a couple of things. One is, you know, if there's a planned demonstration, I think the city, the municipality should provide um, uh, medic tents or, or, or there should be some um, city um, sponsored uh, medical care available to the demonstrators. Uh, oftentimes it falls to medics who are um, who have basic training in what's called street medicine and they can be incredibly helpful. Um, but sometimes as we've seen in recent um, demonstrations and as I said, we've documented in one of our reports, uh, medics themselves um, have been targeted by law enforcement. Uh, they're considered sometimes by some people to be sort of vigilantes themselves, which you know I think I don't think they are. Um, but they're perceived by law enforcement as troublemakers as opposed to people who are helpers and, and providing uh, care. But if you are in a situation where there's violence, there's uh, there's tear gas, there's um, injuries, I would absolutely look for the medics uh, and and seek help. But also to say that. Don't let the medics be your last stop. If you're injured, you need to go to, to an emergency room and you, you two are emergency room doctors. And I know that a lot of people don't end up going to the emergency room for some reason. And maybe Rohini, you can talk about why, um, but seek them out, but don't let that be your last stop. Yes. Yeah, fully agree. Thanks, Rohini. Yes, but Rohini, expand. Why should you not let the medics treatment of your eye or response to an injury on your face or some <clears throat> pain you have in your chest, why should that be the last stop for someone? Uh, what are well, what might the medic miss? That's what I'm getting towards, yeah. So first I'd like to say that I think medics are pretty amazing folks out there. There's a long history of street medics in the country as far back as Vietnam, but I'm sure much longer than that. Um, and I, I think for the vast majority of people who have minor injuries, someone asked about tear gas and how to treat it. If you can get someone to get you a fan or get some fresh air on you or wash it off with soap and water, I don't think all of those people need to go to the emergency room, especially in the setting of COVID. Um, many times these injuries can feel incredibly severe, but they're transient and will go away in some short amount of time. Uh, the medics can also help identify those who can be treated and released and those who might be able might need more care. But certainly if you need more care, especially for folks who are having respiratory problems or uh, severe injuries that you know are hurting with their neurological system or they've been hit in the head or eye, uh, the last thing we'd say is that uh, people should be afraid. So in those settings, come to the emergency department. And for those who are not in the healthcare system, I would stress that uh, laws in this country are incredibly strong in protecting privacy in the emergency department. There is no way we could, you know, we would, anyone in the emergency department would protect patients and make sure that they're treated and law enforcement could not get in and get their names and find out that they were in a protest because they get treated. And so, <laughs> Uh, certainly that happens in several other countries, but in the US our HIPAA laws protect privacy quite well. And so those who are maybe intimidated or afraid of coming to the ER should not be. That's a very good point. <clears throat> in the emergency department in these settings is a place of safety. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think people should rely on that, which is a credit to our law and uh, the ethics and uh, norms of uh, medicine. Um, yeah. The, the other thing I wanted to just uh, about that, and I completely agree that not everyone should go to the emergency room, but from a human rights perspective, um, 
if you if you go to the emergency room, there's going to be a record of what happened. Uh, somebody, a health professional, is going to be noting this information and putting it in a chart. And in some situations, as 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 human rights um, investigators and human rights activists, we want to get that information. But what we're often told is like, well, most people who were injured didn't go to the emergency room, and there's no way to find them. The medics are not the ones who are going to take notes because they're right there trying to deal with dozens of people who are having minor injuries. So, um, so you know, it helps us in a way. Again, I'm not saying that everybody should go to the emergency room by no means uh, if it's unnecessary. But, um, you know, but maybe talk to your doctor, you know, make sure that somebody, somebody's noted it somewhere in a, in a medical chart that it can be later used uh, for, for data mining and for reporting on human rights violations. Anonymous though. So that's, that's where the individual protection is. The data would be anonymized if it's used in the report, which is an important point. <clears throat> um, so there's a, another good question here and I, I'd like to expand it into, um, sort of two uh, points. Um, from my perspective in um, these crowds and demonstrations during the times I've been either there as a protester or as a human rights observer, <clears throat> the, the safest place is usually, and I think Rohini mentioned this, at the edge of the crowd um, because you have more um, uh, options, generally speaking, and you have a wider span of uh, vision, <clears throat> not necessarily the control. Um, people are asking um, uh, what could be guidance to um, someone who wants to demonstrate but does have a disability? Uh, what should they be looking for? How, th how should they protect themselves? Um, how can they minimize the risk if they choose to participate? And uh, that links to um, an observation I have, and I'd like to see if you also agree with it, which is that... Um, when somebody is injured and being treated by a medic, um, I have not seen what I would, as an ED doc, always adopt as a behavior in, in a crowd, which is to take the person who's having trouble away from the source and over to the side. So there's something about the side that I think is, is quite important. And uh, I've given you sort of two different scenarios. Um, so um, Renee, would you like to start and then we'll turn it to Rahidi on that? Yes. Um, again, I, I agree completely that being on the sidelines is uh, safer than being smack in the middle or right in front of law enforcement. And of course, um, you know, as, as Rahini mentioned, some of the crowd control weapons can be completely indiscriminate. So uh, it doesn't mean that you're fully protected. So I believe that everybody, whether they're disabled or not, has a, a right to go and protest. And as we said, most demonstrations and protests have been incredibly peaceful, but um, if you are a person who um, can't run or you have crutches, you have unseen disabilities, uh, you're in a wheelchair, um, I would think twice, but if you do decide to come, make sure you have a buddy, somebody who can help you um, get away. Um, when you get there, look around, see what's, what's, you know, are there any alleys that you shouldn't run down to or you shouldn't try to get to. Um, so we call it situational awareness. Um, so, um, but never go alone if you have any pre-existing conditions that you might need extra help or any visible or invisible um, disabilities. Thank you. Uh, Rohini, please. Um, this is more just from practical experience. I always struggle with, you know, warning people about protesting exactly for what Ranit said is that whether you have asthma or not, you have a right to protest. Um, but certainly it would be wise to take extra precautions, especially in the tense settings that are happening right now. Uh, this summer, I, I have small children who I like to take to protests. But uh, what we did was go to smaller children's protests in Oakland or uh, in Berkeley where that was happening all the time. And, um, and instead of going to like large protests in the evening, we went, you know, to the ones at 11 a.m. where the sun was shining and things were a bit calmer. Um, and to smaller protests, just, you know, 30 kids or something outside the school. And so I think there's ways that we can all exercise these rights, but still minimize the risk being on the side of very large crowds is wise, but also kind of thinking about the time date where these protests are um, would also be wise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the other thing, if I, if you don't mind me adding here is we often focus on 
what happens uh, potentially physically. And um, one thing that a lot of people don't talk about is, you know, when you're in a situation where there's a mass protest or there's violence, um, mental health is affected and it can be affected at the time where you're, you know, you're having a panic attack, but also a day later, two days later, a week later, months later, people can have um, lingering uh, sort of PTSD-like symptoms. And it's really, really important to recognize that if you're an observer of violence, uh, not even if it didn't affect you personally, physically, if you're an observer, if you're in a situation where there's violence, you can be affected from the mental health perspective. So again, as, as you're planning, think about, you know, do you have mental health resources? Are there, um, are there um, referrals that you can think about ahead of time? Um, so don't, don't minimize um, those, those types of uh, symptoms, even though they're not necessarily physical and you, know, you can still see and breathe, um, those are important. Are there um, situations where um, some of these uh, demonstrations go on through the night and then they quiet down sort of in early morning sometimes and then they come back again and as these uh, as these demonstrations stay in one place or one part of a city um, <clears throat> they begin to get more violent they attract people who are also more aggressive on the peaceful side, as well as those who are intermingling um, and taking a side that is not the police side, but are actually after the demonstrators. So I'm talking about the, the peaceful protests that are then um, perhaps get revved up by some people who are more um, aggressive or angry about the day before. And then you have protests, these protests are interrupted by counter protests who and protesters who may actually turn violent. Um, this is certainly a situation in Portland. Uh, and what do you suggest people do when they say they arrive at a situation and it turns out that um, it's not just the police that they have to fear? This is such a complex and interesting issue and, and, and the protest dynamics are, are just really convoluted right now. I would say um, I would say this. I would say the vast majority of protesters, even at night, you know, will never throw a water bottle, will never chuck an apple, um, won't even really scream at the police, right? The vast majority, whatever time of day, are still generally in this country peaceful. But of course, the proportion of people who are, uh, you know, coming there with violent intentions can change over time and over the course of a protest movement as well. And then there's always like a kind of uh, window group. Sometimes they're considered that, um, that if things get tense, if there's, motive, uh, if there's agitation and violence, then, then they might be people that weren't planning on, didn't come there to promote violence, but might get angry and, and do so. And I think this is where uh, community policing is really critical, where the police have an obligation to protect everyone, one side, protesters, anti-protesters, you know, whoever, and where really good communication between protest organizers and the law enforcement uh, administration, whether that's every day or every night, saying which way are you guys planning on going, who are you organizing, how many people do you think are coming, that kind of interplay, which actually does happen very frequently in the US in most of our departments, needs to be really strengthened and supported. And really, that's the only way that we can prevent all the, the total chaos that can occur in places like Portland, where maybe that broke down. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, 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 a very wise observation um, that in, in almost all circumstances, where there have been peaceful demonstrations, um, the police have been in a circumstance of helping to keep it peaceful. And so this is partly what people have to recognize is they're going out to protest some decision about a certain um, city's vote count or something um, that, that law enforcement um, should be given not just the benefit of the doubt, but there should be real proactive outreach on the part of the organizers of the protest to say, this is what we're about. Here's where we're planning to go. What are the no-go zones as far as you're concerned, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is a context which 
you know, underscores our tradition of peaceful protest in the United States and why the um, it, protest has actually had meaning and significance over time in improvement in our polity and our democracy. I'm conscious of time and uh, I would like, I know that um, I would like to turn it over to um, Renit for some final remarks. And uh, that would be then getting us to a, a closing time. Um, Renit, we really have only four minutes um, and that should be a good time for you. <clears throat> you should consider the time yours, take it to whatever desk at level you want and close it for us if that's okay. Sure, thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, uh, Rohini, for this amazing and review of um, crowd control weapons. And as Jennifer was saying, I, I think it all underscores the need to uh, to plan, uh, plan for violence, and hope that there isn't violence. Work with the with law enforcement, and hope you will continue to work with them as opposed to against them. Um, work with um, the health system, whether they're medics or EMS or other, um, and try to make sure that if you're demonstrating that uh, it's not a situation of chaos and um, mayhem. Um, and also on the individual level, um, you know, this is for organizers to, to plan ahead with, with the um, authorities locally, um, but also as individuals uh, to plan ahead, um, know what, what you're going into potentially, um, talk to people, have buddies, figure out what you need to bring, think about scenarios, what happens um, when you um, are caught in a situation that uh, you didn't quite um, want to find yourself in. And I wanted to also uh, remind everybody that it's up to us to be peaceful and um, it's our right to demonstrate, but um, it's up to us to be peaceful. It's up to us um, to try to maintain um, uh, best practices in terms of uh, COVID uh, prevention and other violence prevention um, mitigation efforts. Um, I think that importantly, it's also up to the cities and, um, and states and the Physicians for Human Rights, along with um, several other organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, um, just called the other day um, for uh, governors and mayors and, um, and other municipalities to review their laws and practices ahead of November 3rd, uh, ahead of the elections and to ensure that they protect the right to freedom uh, and freedom of assembly um, um, on during, before, during or after the elections. So everybody is, has a role to play. And so thank you so much for being here. There are a lot of tools and resources that were posted and or can be found on our website. And stay tuned to PHR's website and social media channels for information about our forthcoming webinars uh, in our series. And um, next week, um, it's, a, it's a treat. It's uh, October 29th at 2 p.m. Please join us for a conversation on the global implications of the U.S. withdrawal from the World Health Organization. We're going to have Arupa Dot, who is an executive director and co-founder of Women in Global Health, as a moderator, and two incredible um, individuals as panelists, Dr. Georges Benjamin, who is the executive director of the American Public Health Association, and uh, my colleague at Georgetown, Larry Gostin of the O'Neill Institute um, for National and Global Health Law. And uh, it's going to be an incredible webinar. So please join us by registering at the link that we're posting in the chat. Thank you so much for being here. Please be, be safe. Don't forget to vote um, and create your safety plans. And thank you so much. <laughs>